right, I think we're going to get started now. Um, yeah. So I think for this talk, we're going to take uh, questions at the end, uh, if we have time. Um, so the talk, I think, should be about half an hour long, so we'll see. Um, yeah, just for the sake of trying to get through the presentation. Um, Take questions at the end, and if we run out of time, I'm happy to take questions outside as well, but for the next week coming in. Um, so just to uh, give some background, uh, about a month and a half ago, I went to uh, what is called the Summer Workshop on Pandemics, Bioterrorism, and Global Health Security, um, which was a workshop held at um, George Mason University, and it was a, um, well, I guess I'll go into some of the details on the next slide. Um, but uh, the subtitle of my talk is Three Case Studies on the Risk of Overreaction. Um, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Um, so just kind of give, to give an overview of the workshop. Um, uh, so the participants included about 40 people uh, from all different sectors of society, including academia, industry, and government. Um, we had both public health and security-oriented uh, um, backgrounds represented at the, comp at the workshop. Um, and it was a lecture style format, so um, over the course of three days, um, there were about nine two hour lectures. And so there was a lot of stuff covered in those lectures. Um, and a lot of the things that are not going to be covered today because of lack of time um, are lectures on, you know, the, the content in the lectures on medical countermeasure innovation, case study on Ebola, uh, on Ebola uh, dual use research regulation. And the, there was a lot of interesting stuff. And I encourage you to visit um, our newly launched website, uh, eastbaybiosecurity.org, uh, which has a um, you know, we post videos uh, of these talks as well as um, blog posts, and the, the blog post that is up there right now is um, a report on this uh, on this workshop, um, so you can check that out. Um, so again, uh, the subtitle of my talk was uh, three case studies on the risk of overreaction, uh, and uh, just to briefly introduce, um, I'm going to start off by talking about the polio vaccination campaign in 1955 follow it up with the uh, talking about the swine flu vaccination campaign in 1976, and then to bring it uh, more to the present, I'll finish off by talking about FBI outreach efforts towards the life sciences community um, from 2001 onwards. Um, but before I start going into the first uh, case study in polio, um, I want to mention that this is you know a talk that's kind of specially geared toward this community um, because uh, in you know the effective altruist community, we tend to focus on uh, global catastrophic biological risks or um, extinction risks. Uh, and so I think um, there could be um, kind of a logical, uh, uh, logical jump that because the risks are so great and the, the stakes are so high, if we do have one of these um, you know, pandemic scenarios that uh, gets out of control, um, that um, this means that, we could, that in order to mitigate these risks or prevent these risks from occurring, that we need to have uh, rapid, exaggerated, and harsh risk prevention mitigation measures. Um, and I think this is uh, you know, something that's, that's very logical given, given, the uh, given, the, given the stakes that are, um, that are involved. Um, but in this talk, I, I want to kind of push back against that notion and present some of the counter considerations that uh, one has to take into account um, when kind of weighing the pros and cons of, um, of taking uh, actions that are, uh, again, rapid, exaggerated, and harsh. Um, I don't know if anybody in the uh, access risk community focusing on biosecurity is necessarily making this mistake of, um, of you know, overreaction, but uh, I just want to um, put these considerations on the table because I think it's a log logical mistake that uh, somebody could make. Um, so going into the first case study, um, so uh, in the 1950s there was a, a campaign to uh, end polio and the story kind of begins with um, this man, Basil O'Connor, uh, who was a personal lawyer for FDR, and presumably through his personal interactions with FDR, um, became interested in, um, in polio treatment and uh, became the president of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which was established in 1938 to um, fund and advocate for polio treatment. So O'Connor was known for uh, the use of particularly, particularly aggressive fundraising tactics. Um, so one example um, is uh, this campaign here called the March of Dimes, where he um, asked every, um, uh, every child in the nation to send uh, basically a dime to uh, DC, um, basically just to say, hey, any little bit, uh, any any little bit counts, um, and could help uh, fund polio treatment. And this is kind of the first campaign of that of, of, of that type, where um, it focused on small contributions. Um, and you can see also that um, O'Connor was uh, big on um, putting people in wheelchairs and crutches, kind of in the um, uh, in the public uh, view, 
um, in posters, in newspapers, and things like that. And he really uh, succeeded in getting the public imagination focused on polio. Um, by the early 1950s, O'Connor decides that uh, polio, treat uh, polio treatment isn't going far enough and he wants to eradicate polio, at least in the US, uh, once and for all. So um, th this graph I put here to kind of uh, give you a sense of how successful um, O'Connor was at, uh, at raising money through his um, different fundraising efforts. And so this uh, shows the number of uh, amount of funds that were raised for the top eight health charities at the time in 1954. And you can see that um, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis um, is taking, uh, if you kind of count it up, it's, it's almost half of the money, um, all the money raised that year for these top eight health charities. Um, and you can see the disparity uh, between the money raised and also the number of victims uh, in 1954 of these different diseases that these health charities are raising money for, um, where the foundation that's raising the most money it has the least number of um, people affected. Now, isn't that number of 100,000 post, they've been hammering on it for a while? That's true. Um, yeah, that's true. I didn't take that into account. Um, but it seems that you know, even after they've been hammering out on it for a while, they're still raising all this money to keep, to keep trying to um, fund treatment as well. Um, so it seems there's still some sort of disparity here um, between fundraising and uh, treatment. I thought this is just uh, a nice chart to include for um, those of us who are effective altruist minded. Um, so again, uh, O'Connor started a campaign in the 1950s to end polio, and that started with his recruitment of this medical researcher, Jonas Salk, um, who was a researcher in flu at the time, but uh, O'Connor uh, convinced him to come over to research polio. And by 1952, uh, Salk was able to develop a kill virus polio vaccine, um, which was promising on uh, smaller scales. And so in 1954, uh, O'Connor and Salk decided to embark on what would become the largest clinical trials uh, ever uh, undergone in human history, um, where a staggering uh, 1.8 million uh, children ended up participating uh, in, in these clinical trials. And what's even more uh, surprising, I think, is the fact that most of these children were volunteers, or were volunteered by their, by their parents. Um, and so I, I think this is, um, it kind of captures how much polio is, again, capturing the public imagination at the time, and also is an indication of how much times have changed. I don't think you could get um, a 1.8 billion uh, person clinical trial on an experimental vaccine uh, on something that's, you know, only been, a, a vaccine that's only been around for two years um, to happen today, where everybody would be volunteering and signing up their kids for it. Um, I don't think that would happen. Um, but at least in 1954, um, this campaign was successful to get so many people involved, and you can see again um, the, uh, I guess, the, the stamp of uh, O'Connor in, in being able to brand um, this, this effort and, and calling these kids polio pioneers. So uh, the clinical trials took about uh, one year um, to, to undergo. And in April 12, uh, April 12, 1955, uh, the results of these clinical trials were announced at a national press conference. And really, uh, at this press conference, uh, just to give you a sense of the atmosphere, like everybody was really waiting on these results. Um, and everybody was paying attention to what was going to come out of this pre press conference. Um, you had all these journalists that were kind of waiting for the results. And there was this one story where um, the press conference was supposed to start at 9.10. Uh, people were running a little bit late. And so they got there at like 9.17, and in those intervening seven minutes, the journalists almost like threw a riot because they were just so eager. And so, um, you know, they just really wanted to get the results and be able to start, start writing up stories as soon as possible. Um, but the results came out uh, positive, uh, fortunately for them. So it turns out that the vaccine was 80 to 90 percent effective against polio and uh, about as safe as placebo as well. And so you get all these headlines that come out um, that morning, um, and, you, and you can tell just uh, how excited people were uh, about this um, press conference. Um, so there were a number of polio experts uh, that were in the room at the time, and they were supposed to meet after the report was released and uh, decide whether or not to license the vaccine. Um, and they ended up uh, meeting for uh, under two hours and ended up uh, unanimously recommending immediate licensing of the vaccine. Now, two hours was not enough time for any of these experts to actually read through the report, um, but the, the atmosphere at the time was so um, circus-like that um, none of the experts uh, present, even uh, even one of the leading critics of the vaccine, who was there as well, um, could stand to vote against it and say, um, no, we're not gonna release this vaccine until we have more time to look it over. Um, they just felt this immense public pressure to do so. Um, adding on to that pressure was the fact that O'Connor had already gone to the pharma companies and told them to, to manufacture nine million doses of this vaccine before he even knew what the results of the, the clinical trials were because he, were, he was so 
I'm kind of bullish on the results. He thought it was definitely going to come out OK. Um, and so again, that kind of adds to the pressure of how can you say no uh, to licensing this vaccine when really, there's literally 9 million doses that are just sitting on the shelves waiting to be distributed. Um, so there really was this, um, this immense pressure there. Um, so unfortunately, this uh, story doesn't, uh, doesn't end all that well, um, at least in the short term. So um, within two weeks, uh, vaccinated children started uh, suspiciously coming down with polio. And at, at the very beginning, uh, this wasn't all that suspicious because you know, it was only 90, 80 to 90% effective. Um, but after a number of cases started piling up, um, and you know, there, there were also a number of factors that contributed to um, the suspicion. So um, uh, they found that all these cases, the polio uh, uh, started to, um, people started to come down with polio about four to 10 days after the vaccination. They started to come down with polio starting in the exact same arm that they were inoculated in um, and injected with the vaccine in. And um, also they were all injected with vaccine from one particular pharma company called Cutter Labs, um, actually located in Berkeley, as it turns out. <laughs> um, so uh, people started wondering, could the Cutter Labs vaccine actually be causing polio rather than preventing it? Um, so even though there was no, um, you know, it's hard to tell for sure, by April 27th, remember the press conference was on April 12th, so this has been within two weeks, uh, Cutter Labs agrees to remove the vaccine from the market. Um, but at that time, it was already too late for, for many. Um, so it turns out that within those two weeks, 400,000 of these uh, doses of vaccine had already been distributed. 120,000 of those doses were contaminated with live virus. So that's a full 30% of the doses. Um, that really speaks to a huge manufacturing uh, protocol failure on, on, the, on the part of Cutter Labs. Um, 40,000 people came down with uh, what is called a board of polio, which is a fairly minor um, minor kind of uh, temporary disease. Uh, but 164 ended up being permanently paralyzed and 10 people died as a result. Um, and um, as well, uh, you can imagine there was a huge drop in public confidence in the virus, uh, in, in the vaccine. Um, people you know, didn't really trust the pharma companies anymore. And uh, throughout the rest of 1955, very few people received the vaccine. Um, and so uh, throughout the rest of 1955, there were over 28,000 cases of paralytic polio that were reported that could have been prevented had this incident not occurred and not, um, um, not uh, torpedo public confidence. So uh, the question, um, of, of course, that everybody's asking is how could this happen? Um, you know, the manufacturers were uh, seemed to be able to manufacture enough of the clinical trials, so how, how come things fell apart when it came time for actual distribution? Um, so there were a number of investigations that occurred afterwards that were inconclusive, but um, one theory that uh, a lot of people proposed was that perhaps uh, aggregation of the viral particles um, due to sitting out too long prevented exposure um, of uh, what was supposed to kill the virus, which is uh, formalin. Um, and um, it turns out that when the clinical trials were going on, the NIH and Jonas Salk himself uh, we're going around to the different pharma companies and closely supervising their manufacturing protocols. Um, but when it came time for actual distribution, um, that supervision uh, didn't occur anymore. And so these manufacturing protocols kind of fell apart. Um, so what are the lessons we can draw from this? Uh, so I would say that one of the um, major reasons why um, the Cutter incident happened was uh, you can kind of pin some of the blame on the National Foundation for just kind of hyping up this polio eradication campaign and really putting so much pressure on, um, on the, um, on the uh, polio experts that were at, at the press conference, uh, as well as the manufacturers, to really get this um, uh, production and distribution um, campaign underway as fast as possible. Uh, and the second, uh, second lesson is that public confidence really is a, a scarce resource, and um, it can be squandered just like any other resource, um, just like syringes. If you don't have enough syringes, then you can't produce vaccine. If you don't have public confidence, then you also can't get vaccine to people. And so, um, this should be treated like a resource just like any other. So going on to the uh, second case study, um, the swine flu vaccination campaign in 1976. So uh, to, to go into this case study, this uh, requires uh, some, uh, some historical backdrop. So um, of course, uh, many here already know, um, and as Anjali noted, uh, the 19 flu pandemic, uh, 1918 flu pandemic, um, which is an H1N1 strain, um, turned out to be uh, one of the most uh, horrific uh, public health uh, disasters in, uh, in uh, world history. Uh, so ended up being about 50 million deaths uh, worldwide. And at the time, effective treatments and vaccines were, were unavailable. And so really the public health community at the time was, um, 
was uh, just kind of powerless to, to stop this um, from roiling the, the world. Um, and you can see this graph here, this is just in the US, but I think uh, if you look at a worldwide chart, it might be similar, um, where you have a steady rise in life expectancy, but just the 1918 flu really cratered that um, for a short period of time. Um, so you can see the real impact um, uh, of this flu pandemic. Uh, so the next uh, two major flu pandemics of the 20th century were 1957 and 1968, and while these were milder than the 1918 flu pandemic, um, they still resulted in about one million deaths worldwide each, and uh, vaccine technology had regressed um, uh, at that point, um, but still during these two flu pandemics, production started uh, too late and too, little, uh, too few doses were uh, ended up being distributed, um, and were only able to be distributed after the pandemic had already peaked. Um, because the public health community had difficulty organizing and, and getting distribution underway um, at enough time. So again, during these two pandemics, the, um, the public health community felt this, this um, kind of sense of failure or, or uh, powerlessness to stop the, the pandemic from, from occurring. Um, so flat, uh, fast forward to uh, 1976 in February, uh, there was a case of a young soldier who died of a new strain of H1N1. Um, and the fact that this was H1N1, um, which uh, caused the 1918 flu pandemic, um, really raised the specter of, uh, could this be 1918 all over again? Uh, additionally, uh, the fact that it killed a young soldier who was otherwise healthy um, uh, also raised uh, the specter because the 1918 flu pandemic was unusually concentrated among 20 to 40 year olds. Um, this new strain of H1N1, uh, even more scarily, was found to be capable of person-to-person -person transmission. So. Um, again, that made people think that perhaps this could be 1918 redux. And uh, on March 13th, uh, about a, a month after the initial detection, the CDC director, David Sensor, sends a very strong memo to the White House uh, recommending that a national immunization program be, um, be started immediately. Um, so I just want to uh, read a few highlights from that, um, from that memo. Um, and one White House official remembers recalling uh, that that memo is basically a gun to our head, uh, that we had to really act. Um, so uh, the sensor starts off by um, recalling the 1918 pandemic by saying, the virus is antigenically related to the influenza virus which has been implicated as the cause of the 1918-1919 pandemic, which killed 450,000 people uh, in the US. <laughs> um, present evidence and past experience indicate a strong possibility that this country will experience a widespread supply of influenza in 1976 to 77. The situation is one of go or no go. A decision must be made now. Any recommendations for action must be directed toward the goal of immunizing 213 million people in three months, basically every man, woman, and child in the country. Um, so you'll see I have this little asterisk by strong possibility, and this is kind of one of the lessons that, we'll, that I'll talk about in the future. Um, but it turns out that uh, personal estimates by CDC, CDC officials at the time, whilst in private meetings, only range from about 2% to 20% that this would become a pandemic at all, let alone a 1918-style pandemic. Um, and so somehow this got elevated from 2%, 20% to strong possibility. Um, and for those of you who have read the book Super Forecasting by, by Philip Tetlock, this kind of, um, I don't know, that, that kind of uh, invoked uh, some of those stories in, in my head, um, just that you can use the word strong possibility to mean like really anything you want. It's all about the interpretation of that statement. Um, and uh, the kind of context of this memo, would, you would interpret strong possibility to mean more than 2% to 20%. Um, and also I think another lesson from this is that um, this is really driven by David Sensor, and so it kind of shows just how, at least at the time, how one person could have such a huge impact on the national policy. Uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah, national policy. Um, so uh, I just want to go through some of the further rationales people had for action. It wasn't just the specter of um, being 1918 all over again. Um, there was an additional fact that uh, swine flu had been circulating only in pigs for 50 years, so they had detected in humans. Um, until now, and so the population would have no pre-existing immunity to any pandemic that occurred. Um, this third point, um, I think, is uh, very sketchy in retrospect. So people had this uh, theory that influenza pandemics seemed to come in about 11-year cycles, even though nobody really knew why at the time, um, and the theory uh, turns out not to be true. Um, so they said that oops, they said that uh, in 1946 there was a pandemic. It was kind of a mild pandemic, so um, you know you could leave it on, the, you could put it on this list or not. 1957, 1968, we already talked about. Uh, 1976, you'll see it doesn't really fit the, fit the data. It comes after eight years. Um, but they're saying it's close enough to 11, right? And also left off this list as 1918, which doesn't fit the data at all, right? So this is super, super speculative, but um, some people, I guess, saw it as uh, uh, a good reason to kind of go ahead with the immunization campaign. 
Um, and I think this might be the, the biggest reason, and the reason that I think speaks most to me. And um, I can see how um, I can see how one would be tempted to go ahead with a, nation, a nationwide immunization program, given this reason, which is that protection occurred at the tail end of the normal flu season in February, which means that before the uh, virus was presumed to return in the fall, uh, they would have a full six months to produce the vaccine. This is never, uh, never before the case. In 1957-1968, they only detect, detected it late, which meant that they didn't have enough uh, time to start producing vaccine. Um, so somebody called it an opportunity unparalleled in previous influenza history, and this leading flu researcher, I think, captured kind of the ethos of the time, which was, for the first time in history, the impact of pandemic influenza, the last great plague, will have been blunted by human intervention. So there's this real temptation to be to say, we're going to be the ones to make history. We're not going to make that mistake again of, of starting vaccine production too late. Um, so you can, I don't know, I can place myself in their shoes and say, you know, I, I could see how that could be really tempting. As a public health community that also at the time felt um, super undervalued by the government and by people, um, this, they were thinking, you know, this is our time to make our mark. Um, and really show the world that public health can be um, you know, a massive life-saving uh, uh, investment. Uh, so the uh, National Swine Flu Immunization Program uh, was signed into law on April 15th, and uh, over the next few months, uh, vaccine production and distribution um, uh, went underway with distribution starting on October 1st. And over the course of the program, 25% of the population, or about 40 million people, would be immunized. Um, but it turns out that the pandemic never materialized, and this is something that people were starting to worry about even as the immunization campaign uh, came underway, because uh, usually for large pandemics you start to see some cases over the summer, and that wasn't really happening. And so by October 1st, people were already wondering, is this, is this thing ever going to come, or, or is it just, um, you know, is it actually uh, not, going to, not going to materialize? So um, to kind of add insult to injury, uh, it turns out that not only did the pandemic never materialize, but also the vac uh, vaccination was associated with an increased risk of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a rare neurological disease that in the worst cases can um, escalate to paralysis. And so uh, about 450 people came down with this disease as a result. Um, so you know, for these reasons, on December 16th, the vaccination program was shut down. Uh, the next year, on February 4th, uh, David Sensor was replaced as the head of the CDC. Um, and this was uh, really viewed as a, a huge black mark on the CDC for a long time. Uh, and you can see that um, the New York Times uh, called it a fiasco. So what are the lessons that we can learn from this? Um, well, first of all, uh, the de decision-making process uh, uh, in this case was, uh, I would say, not well calibrated at all. We saw how the 2% to 20% uh, really got escalated to strong possibility. Um, and uh, in addition, that, that uncertainty was suppressed. Uh, it wasn't really communicated to policymakers at all. Um, and so I think in the future, uh, when making decisions, um, you know, public health officials and policymakers really have to um, acknowledge uh, uncertainty and be able to um, make decisions uh, in the face of that uncertainty rather than suppressing it and just trying to um, take action no matter what the, pos what, no matter what the probability. And in addition, um, while David Sensor uh, uh, kind of advertised this as a, a go or no-go situation, um, uh, really, the decision making should have been made flexible in the face of uncertainty. Because, um, you know, if you saw, if you start, to, if you started to see that there were no cases over the summer, you could have said, "Hey, let's like slow down the production. Let's not actually start distributing until we're sure that the pandemic will, will materialize." Um, but instead, they said, "We started this. We have to finish it the way that we originally planned it," which I think is not not uh, good decision making advice in the in the face of uncertainty. Um, so finally, uh, I just have a few slides on uh, FBI outreach efforts toward the life sciences community. Um, so starting in the 2000s, uh, just to give a little bit of historical background about things that were happening at the time, uh, of course in, the t in 2001 there were the anthrax, anthrax attacks in which um, the scientist Bruce Ivins was essentially the prime suspect, and also uh, DIY bio or do-it-yourself biology was um, starting to come on the scene uh, in around 2005. And so law enforcement really saw the scientific community as a source of threats at the time. Um, so I think this is my favorite anecdote of the conference. Um, <laughs> So the FBI <laughs> started a program to kind of reach out to the life sciences community and say, hey, we want your help to, uh, to thwart bioterrorism. Um, but they unwisely decided to call this a program, the Science and Technology Outreach Program, which has the acronym STOP. Um, so I think that really tells you uh, kind of the attitude that law enforcement had towards the scientific community, that they were really just a generate, uh, generator of threats, and they weren't really doing anything valuable. They were just something that had to be uh, you know, watched and um, monitored. 
Um, and so it's no surprise that in 2008, uh, a survey concluded that scientists are suspicious of the FBI and feel that they do not work well with the scientific community. And so this kind of general, um, uh, general attitude by the FBI and this general uh, approach, uh, I think the consensus at the time was that this is really not working and that we need to change our approach. So in 2010 onward, um, the FBI basically did a 180. And so they started to view scientific community, the scientific community as a partner to combat drugs, because really, if you want to know if there's some uh, bioterrorist in a garage or some, something somewhere, um, or uh, insider threat in an academic lab, your best um, resource is going to be the scientific community itself. You're, you're going to want, you're, uh, that's going to be your eyes on the ground. You want those people to have a good relationship with you so that they can feel uh, confident that when they come approach you about uh, potential threats that um, you won't uh, be overly, um, uh, you won't react uh, in, in an overly aggressive way and shut down um, all, of the, uh, all of their scientific work. Um, so in 2010, um, the FBI renamed their uh, STOP program, the Biological Sciences Outreach Program, um, and this uh, ended up focusing more, much more on building constructive relationships uh, between the science and security communities. And um, uh, Ed Yu, who's pictured here, was really the spearhead, uh, spearheading this, this uh, effort by the FBI. Um, so one of the things that the FBI has been doing uh, recently is sponsoring the uh, iGEM competition, which is the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. Um, which uh, takes um, takes uh, high school uh, uh, undergraduates, I think mostly, uh, and has them do basically genetic engineering experiments. Um, and so the FBI is sponsoring this in order to be kind of seen as a supporter of science, and uh, they want to acknowledge that most scientists are good and responsible, um, and they have a booth there as well to promote safety and responsibility. Um, and this is something that I don't think you would ever have seen 10 years ago. Um, this is a DIY bio event where they say, invite an FBI agent to participate. Um, so you can see how far the, the relationship between the DIY bio and the life sciences community at large and the FBI uh, has come in uh, about 10 years. Um, so some lessons from this. Uh, engaging communities that may harbor threats can be more effective than cracking down um, because that's really the difference between getting buy-in from these communities versus stoking resentment and um, uh, creating a chill that would um, affect uh, any sort of uh, further action. Um, so just to summarize, um, I think uh, these three case studies have shown that um, you know, there, are, there are risks of going too fast, um, you know, releasing the polio vaccine before uh, people have really had a good chance to vet it, uh, risks of miscalibration, um, you know, uh, saying that there was a strong possibility of flu pandemic when people thought it could be only 2% to 20%, and also there are risks of severity or uh, you know, punitive measures that could alienate um, communities that you, that you really need. Um, so I want to just go back to that uh, initial question that we uh, posed at the beginning. If a special focus on uh, GCBRs necess necessitates uh, rapid, exaggerated, and harsh risk prevention and mitigation measures, and I would say that um, you know not necessarily. Uh, there are consequences for um, doing things too rapidly. Um, you can lose public trust. Doing things in an exaggerated manner. Um, really, you want to be uh, making decisions in a well-calibrated manner um, and acknowledge uncertainty. And doing things in a harsh manner um, where you can alienate communities. Um, and the, uh, the, last, the, the last thing I want to leave you with is that taking risks seriously doesn't have to involve uh, taking serious risks, which can happen uh, if you, um, if you uh, do things too rapidly or in an exaggerated or harsh manner. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you, and I think we'll probably just take questions outside if there are any, uh, given that the next year is. Thanks.